Welcome to every one of you and an extra special welcome to alumni, there's a whole group of them, to uh, first year students and first year attendees. We are really happy to have you among our poetry community. We're delighted to open the Poetry Center's 15th year by welcoming back Jane Hirschfield. Wrong solitude vinegars the soul. Right solitude oils it. I don't think any other poet besides Jane Hirschfield could quite have written those lines. And I think we need them. I know I do. Jane Hirschfield's carefully but unobtrusively crafted poems are an extension of a life lived and examined, faced squarely. As she says, at some point I realized that you don't get a full human life if you try to cut off one end of it. That you need to agree to the entire experience, to the full spectrum of what happens. Everything I am and know and have lived goes into a poem. In poems that shine with clarity and awareness, she offers graceful and deliberate observations of the natural and the emotional world. Her poems invite us to enter them fully and mindfully. Knowledge is erotic, she writes. A poem should create the desire to know more deeply, to live with it in intimacy. I'm quoting her again. The activity of poetry is to tell us we must change our lives. It does this by posing again and again a question that cannot be answered except with our whole being, body, speech, and mind. What is the nature of this moment, poetry asks. Each in its own fresh way, Jane Hirschfield's poems explore this question, drawing us into a musing state that allows us to dig deeper, to formulate our own questions, to experience our own mind and moments. As she writes in the poem Rebus, each thought is a life you have lived or failed to live. Each word is a dish you have eaten or left on the table. Tonight we welcome and celebrate the extraordinary assembling consciousness that has made these poems. Jane Hirschfield. Well, I am thrilled to be back in this extraordinary community um, to see uh, Ellen, a most astonishing and fabulous poet, and to be with this community of scholars who do seem to me universally to be practicing the art of scholarship with the whole life, the whole being. So it's privileged. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read entirely from the new book and uh, begin adventurously with the first poem. French Horn. For a few days only, the plum tree outside the window shoulders perfection. No matter the plums will be small, eaten only by squirrels and jays. I feast on the one thing, they on another, the shoaling bees on a third. What in this unpleated world isn't someone's seduction? The boy playing his intricate horn in Mahler's fifth, in the gaps between playing, turns it and turns it, dismantles a section, shakes from it the condensation of human passage. He is perhaps 20. Later he takes his four bows, his face deepening red, while a girl holds a viola's spruce wood and maple in one half-opened hand and looks at him hard. Let others clap. These two, their ears still ringing, hear nothing. Not the shouts of bravo, bravo, not the tympanic clamor inside their bodies. As the plums blossoms do not hear the bee, nor taste themselves turned into storable honey by that sumptuous disturbance. So the next poem I'm going to read uh, 
is one of the very few poems I've ever written which alludes to the fact that I did grow up on East 20th Street in New York City. Um, and perhaps what gave me permission to speak of buses and subways was that the poem came out of being the uh, writer in residence for an old growth forest on Oregon's Western Cascades, uh, the H.J. Andrews. And this is an extraordinary experience for a writer because they give you an education when you go there. And the whole program is extraordinary. For one thing, this is the forest that we owe the preservation of old growth forests to. Uh, the people who are now the senior scientists there, when they were young and looking for something to write their PhD theses about, uh, said, um, gosh, it would be interesting to study what's happening on the top of these trees. And their professor said, why would you want to do that? You won't have a career. All the big trees are going to be cut down within 20 years. There will be no field left for you to study. They said, we'd like to look anyhow. Uh, then they had to figure out how to look. And this was a problem because this was as unexplored terrain as, you know, the deepest uh, cavernous abysses in the ocean. Nobody had, had gotten to the canopy. And the first thing they did was cut down a big tree and it fell and it exploded and you couldn't study anything because it was all a wreck. And then they were thinking, well, what do we do now? And I love this part of the story. Two young women graduate students said, we know how to, how to look. And they said, how? And they said, we're mountain climbers. So they took their pitons and their climbing ropes and they got up there and later ways were developed of, of using bows and arrows to shoot lines over the branches so you didn't have to you know, stick anything into the trees to get, to get up. And so began the entire field of canopy biology. Um, the, the endangered spotted owl lives in this forest. Um, another thing which lives in this forest are in the undergrowth of the big trees, yew trees, yew trees that gave us taxol, which gave us tamoxifen, which is a drug which has saved the lives of many women I know. It's a breast cancer recurrence uh, preventative. And so, you know, as I walked through this forest, I was continually in tears because I would pass a yew tree or, or, you know, it was just, I was so moved by the fact that this was where they figured out that these old trees are not decrepit and useless. As a poet, I am a great fan of the useless. Um, so the last thing I learned, and I promise you this will be the longest introduction of the evening and Biology 101 is about to draw to a close, but the last thing that I learned was about the nitrogen cycle. So they used to think that what brought the nitrogen to support these immense trees was the salmon pulse coming up creek. And then they figured out it's not. It's that litter trashy stuff that you walk over. The little scraps of looks like torn up sponges and things. And it turns out these are the lichens that grow on the canopy uh, convert nitrogen and then drift down, you know, like, like little, little trash and snow and things like that, and recycle through this entire enormous system. So that got me thinking about all the useless little ignored things that matter, and that led to this poem. There, the poem, finally. <laughs> For the Lobaria, Usnea, Witch's Hair, Map Lichen, Beard Lichen, Ground Lichen, shield lichen. Back then, what did I know? The names of subway lines, buses, how long it took to walk 20 blocks, uptown and downtown, not north, not south, not you. When I saw you later, seaweed reefed in the air, you were gray-green, incomprehensible, old. What you clung to, hung from, old, trees looking half dead, stones. Marriage of fungi and algae, chemists of air, changers of nitrogen unusable into nitrogen usable. Like those nameless ones who kept painting, shaping, engraving, unseen, unread, unremembered. 
not caring if they were no good, if they were past it. Rock wools, water fans, earth scale, mouse ears, dust, ash of the woods. Transformers, unvalued, uncounted. Cell by cell, word by word, making a world they could live in. I live with a molecular biophysicist, and I tell you this so that you can know that all my poems are fact-checked. Um, <laughs> And this next one, I have to say, so men, men, they are fact-checked with the in-house scientist, but also, of course, we have many scientist friends. Um, and this one happened to have been double fact-checked by Saul Perlmutter, who won the Nobel today. <laughs> Astrophysicist. So, yay, Saul. Okay. Um, first light edging cirrus. 10 to the 25th molecules are enough to call wood thrush or apple. A hummingbird, fewer. A wristwatch, 10 to the 24th. An alphabet's molecules, tasting of honey, iron, and salt, cannot be counted. As some strings, untouched, sound when a near one is speaking. So it was when love slipped inside us, it looked out face to face in every direction. Then it was inside the tree, the rock, the cloud. And since that is a love poem, I thought I would follow it with a solitude poem um, so that everybody would be included. Um, <laughs> And because, you know, over the course of a life, whether quickly or slowly, there's always an oscillation between these two conditions. Um, so you, you've already heard um, a touch of this poem, uh, Vinegar and Oil. Wrong solitude vinegars the soul. Right solitude oils it. How fragile we are between the few good moments. Coming and going unfinished, puzzled by fate, like the half-carved relief of a fallen donkey above a church door in Finland. So I have, as it turns out, an enormous number of poems with food references in them, um, I suppose because I eat. Uh, and, and I was never aware of how many there were until people started asking me to be in food anthologies. <laughs> and then, you know, you go through your books and you're 37, 38, 39. It's like, no, I can't send them 42 poems. I have to, I have to pick. Um, so anyhow, this one stays in the kitchen, but instead of concerning itself with edibles, it concerns itself with implements. Stone and knife. One angle blunts, another sharpens. Loss also, stone and knife. Some griefs augment the heart, enlarge. Some stunt. Scentless loose strife, rooms unwalked in. These losses are small. Others cannot be described at all. So 2008 was a year when there were fires all up and down the state of California. Um, it was just, you know, every, everywhere, if you drove up the highway, you know, every 15 or 20 miles, there was, a, there was evidence of a fresh fire. And in 77, I fought a forest fire um, I, in, in a wilderness, and... I have kept a very strong and powerful sense of awe in the strict sense of that word, where things are not only awesome, but they are also terrifying, um, and intimacy. Uh, and so with the 2008 fire, thinking about all of this, in 77, uh, we basically saved the place we were with backfiring. And so... Uh, with the smoke all, of, all around me in 2008, I wrote this poem, which refers to the 
discovery of the backfiring technique, which happened in 1923 in the um, infamous and terrible Man Gulch Fire, uh, which was written about so beautifully in the book Young Men and Fire. Heat and desperation. Preparation, she thought, as if a pianist, limbering, stretching. But fingers are tendon, not spirit, are bone and muscle and skin. Increase of reach extends reach, but not what comes then to fill it. What comes to fill it is something that has no name, a hunger from outside the wolf-colored edges. Thirteen smoke jumpers died at Man Gulch. Two ran faster. One stopped, set a match ahead of himself, ahead of the fire, then stepped up slope, lay down inside still burning ashes, and lived. And uh, this reminds me of um, something Sartre said. He said, genius isn't intelligence, it's how we invent in desperate circumstances. Uh, so this one was, was checked with um, a neuroscientist, um, but its last premise is often argued with. So all I can say is technically it's true, but I can understand that it doesn't always feel that way. Okay, narrowness. Day after day, my neighbor's cat's in the garden, each in a distant spot, like wary planets. One brindled gray, one black and white, one orange. They remind of the feelings, how one cannot know another completely. The way two cats cannot sleep in one patch of mint-scented shade. The conversation. A woman moves close. There is something she wants to say. The currents take you one direction, her another. All night you are aware of her presence, aware of the conversation that did not happen. Inside it are mountains, birds, a wide river, a few sparse-leaved trees. On the river, a wooden boat putters. On its deck, a spider washes its face. Years from now, the boat will reach a port by the sea, and the generations of spider descendants upon it will look out from their nearsighted eightfold eyes at something unanswered. So I am, I will be the first to admit, a little strange. Um, and this next poem is particularly strange to some people, although since, you know, the room is full of a fair number of practicing Buddhists, less strange perhaps to them. Um, but it's, it's about a um, joyous moment of epiphany I had on my window seat with a cottage cheese container. Um, noticing the expiration date and going, oh, I'm going to die too. Um, so, uh, you know, anyhow, <laughs> we'll see how you feel about this. <laughs> Perishable, it said. Perishable, it said on the plastic container, and below, in different ink, the date to be used by the last teaspoon consumed. I found myself looking now at the back of each hand, now inside the knees, now turning over each foot to look at the soul, then at the leaves of the young tomato plants, then at the arguing jays, under the wooden table and lifted stones, looking, coffee cups, olives, cheeses, hunger, sorrow, fears. These two would certainly vanish without knowing when. How suddenly then the strange happiness took me, like a man with strong hands and strong mouth, inside that hour, with its perishing perfumes and clashings. So in Japanese poetry, which I have been uh, much 
influenced by from an early age. Um, whenever they mention um, something like the moon or a time of year, it means both the literal moon, but also is referring to a certain phase of something. So a full moon in Japanese poetry might be a reference to Buddhist awakening. If it's a love poem, it might be a reference to love at its full height. And times of year are usually corresponding with either the stage of a relationship or the stage of a person's life. And, and I say this all to apologize. This poem, given my actual age, should probably be titled Love in September, um, but it's not. It's titled Love in August. White moths against the screen in August darkness. Some clamor in envy. Some spread large as two hands of a thief who wants to put back in your cupboard the long-taken silver. So this poem, um, I was working at the McDowell Colony in New Hampshire, and outside my window there was what the poem describes, and particularly to my b delight, a woodchuck. And he was a very, very, I suppose he or she, was a very, very solitary woodchuck, never any company. And you know, if I so much as moved from 10 feet inside from the window and he saw the motion, he would immediately vanish. So I was watching this creature, and it suddenly occurred to me, and again, you know, this is a non-fact-checked and arguable premise, but, you know, I thought every mammal born was born from a momentary instant of sexual swooning. Um, you know, the genesis of the woodchuck. There was ecstasy. Um, so that led to this. of yield and abandon. A muscular, thick, pelted woodchuck, created in yield, in abandon, lifts onto his haunches. Behind him, abundance of ferns, a rock wall's coldness, never in sun, a few noisy grackles. Our eyes find shining beautiful because it reminds us of water. To say this does not make fewer the rooms of the house or lessen its zinc-sealinged hallways. There is something that waits inside us, a nearness that fissures, that fishes. Leaf shine and stone shine, edging the tail of the woodchuck silver, splashing the legs of chickens and clouds. In Russian, the translator told me, there is no word for thirsty. A sentence, as always, impossible to translate. But what is the point of preserving the bell if to do so it must be filled with concrete or wax, a body prepared for travel but not for singing? So it is shocking, but apparently, you know, they've got hungry but they don't have thirsty. Um, and so the line in question, which was from an earlier book, um, uh, the woman said, could I say sides drawn in with thirst? And I said, does it sound good in Russian? She said, yes. I said, okay. <laughs> it's amazing the difference between languages. Um, just, just astonishing what you can and can't say. Uh, which you don't find out unless you either are translating or are being translated. Um, many people who I know have some relationship in some way right now uh, with Alzheimer's or another form of dementia. You know, a parent, a loved one's parent, a spouse, um, I hope not oneself. Um, but this poem comes from visiting a man who I know would not mind being named the absolutely terrific, now late, Berkeley poet Leonard Nathan. And 
Leonard phoned me up one day and said, I've been diagnosed with early Alzheimer's. If I ever say something a little weird to you, that, that'll be why. But, you know, mostly I'll just call on the good days anyhow. Um, and for years, you couldn't tell anything. Um, and then finally, things got a little worse, and he and his wife first moved to an easier house. And then I got a phone call from her saying that he was in a residential care place uh, not too far from me, and that he still very much enjoyed visitors. And so there was a lapse. I was traveling a lot. It was, it was I don't know, maybe six weeks. And I didn't want to distress his wife, so I phoned the director of the place and said, what should I expect? You know, I'd never seen anyone with Alzheimer's at that, at that late a stage before, and I just wanted to be a little prepared. And she painted the most dire picture for me of what I should expect. And when I went, it was much better. I mean, he did know who he was. He did know who I was. He did know he'd been a poet. Um, and, and um, you know, I'm sure had he lived longer, that would have passed. But this poem describes the experience of this particular visit, which it was just something I hadn't thought about or realized. Alzheimer's. When a fine old carpet is eaten by mice, the colors and patterns of what's left behind do not change. As bedrock tilted stays bedrock, its purple and red striations unbroken. Unstrippable birthright grandeur. How are you, I asked, not knowing what to expect. Contrary to Keatsian joy, he replied. You know, I don't think I could say something that good on my best day. <laughs> if truth is the lure, humans are fishes. Under each station of the real, another glimmers. And so the love of false bottom drawers and the salt mines outside Krakow going down and down without drowning. A man harms his wife, his child. He says, here is the reason. She says, here is the reason. The child says nothing, watching him led away. If truth is the lure, Humans are fishes. All the fine bones of that eaten up story, think about them. Their salt cod, whiteness on whiteness. So it is time to lighten a little and go back to the realm of food. Although this is a food which um, is, is, is not actually in your pantry. Um, left-handed sugar. In nature, molecules are chiral. They turn in one direction or the other. Naturally then, someone wondered, might sugar built to mirror itself be sweet, but pass through the body unnoticed? <laughs> A dieter's gold mine. I don't know why the experiment failed or how. I think of the loneliness of that man-made substance, like a ghost in a 50s movie you could pass your hand through, or some suitor always rejected despite the sparkle of his cubic zirconia ring. Yet this sugar is real and somewhere exists. It looks for a left-handed tongue. China. Whales follow the whale roads. Geese, roads of magnetized air. To go great distance, exactitudes matter. Yet how often the heart that set out for Peru arrives in China, steering hard, consulting the charts the whole journey. So I thought that poem should take us to China. 
Um, in 2009, I saw on different trips uh, the ancient capitals of both China and Japan. So those of us who, who know these things only through literature and earlier translations, um, Chang'an is what the ancient capital of China is called in all those translations we read, but now it's called Xi'an. Um, and Kyoto was Heian-kyo, um, uh, the ancient capital of, of Japan. And uh, those both appear in here, but the other thing which lies behind it is is that I have long adopted a uh, Japanese custom, I don't know if this is actually a Chinese custom as well, of doing an absolutely maniacal house cleaning on New Year's Eve, where I try to do everything that you would never think of touching otherwise. So things like take down the track lights in the kitchen and wash the tops of them. Um, so it's, it's uh, and, and I try every year, I've been in my house since 1984, and I always try to find one thing I've never found before. And so far, I still do. Um, but what this poem is describing, I've done from the first year. Washing doorknobs. The glass doorknobs turn no differently, but every December I polish them with vinegar, water, and cotton. Another year ends. This one I ate Kyoto pickles and touched in Xi'an a stone turtle's face, cold as stone as turtle. I could not read the fortune carved into its shell or hear what it had raised its head to listen for such a long time. Around it, the madness of empires continued, an unbitted horse that runs for a thousand miles between grazing. Around us, the madness of empires continues. How happy we are, how unhappy we are, doesn't matter. The stone turtle listens, the famished horse runs. Washing doorknobs, one year enters another. And what lies behind that poem is a thread, I think this is the only one I will read tonight, but it is a thread that runs through the book of awareness that the entire time I was writing this book, this country has been at war, and still are. Um, everything has two endings. Everything has two endings. A horse, a piece of string, a phone call. Before a life air and after, as silence is not silence, but a limit of hearing. So I write um, a lot of very short poems, and um, some of them in this book and in the last book, I have uh, called pebbles and put them all together in a series. They are individual and separate poems, but it seemed rude to the trees to have that many pages with just three or four lines on them. Um, and the pebbles, they are not riddles, they are not jokes, they are not koans, they are not aphorisms. But like any of those things, they are not finished until you have taken them in and had some response to them. So they work the same way as all of those things do. And I'll just read you a little sample of them. And we are rounding the far corner of, of the evening. Like moonlight seen in a well. Like moonlight seen in a well, the one who sees it blocks it. Mountain and mouse both move, one only more slowly. The familiar stairs, how confidently the blind descend familiar stairs. Only those with something to lose grow timid at darkfall. 
Memorial. When hearing went, you spoke more. A kindness. Now I must. The Cloudy Vase. Past time, I threw the flowers out, washed out the cloudy vase. How easily the old clearness leapt, like a practice tiger, back inside it. That's in the newest um, Best American Poetry that just came out, and it is so much the shortest poem in the book. It looks like a happy dachshund among the wolfhounds. Um, okay. Uh, night and day. Who am I is the question of owls. Crow says, get up. Uh, this is another one from 2008, and it might help to say Sonoma is the next county over from mine. They had fires, my county did not. Um, and my apologies to anyone who may have lost a house to fire. Um, Sonoma fire. Large moon, the deep orange of embers, also the scent. The griefs of others, beautiful at a distance. Opening the hands between here and here. On the dark road, only the weight of the rope, yet the horse is there. So just a few more. Um, this next one is one of the two poems from the book that uh, Garrison Keeler read on his Writer's Almanac program. And I will just say, so the poem is called Three-Legged Blues, and it's not in proper blues form, but that's because it's three-legged. And if you want to hear it in proper blues form, somebody changed it up with me and, and, um, and has sung it, and you can find it on the Drunken Boat website, uh, looking like it's supposed to sound, I suppose. Um, but this is basically, you know, we all go through some really bad patches, and um, I've, uh, this, this was a response to such a bad patch, but I don't want you all to think it's absolutely literal to me, um, because uh, my beloved would be very upset if you thought that. Uh, Three-legged blues. Always you were given one too many, one too few. What almost happens doesn't. What might be lost, you'll lose. The crows will eat your garden. Weeds will get what's left. Your cats will be three-legged. Your house is mice, be blessed. One friend will take your husband, another wear your dress. No, it isn't what you wanted, it isn't what you choose. Your floors have always slanted. Your roof has paid its dues. Life delivered you a present, a too small pair of shoes. What almost happened won't now. What can be lost, you'll lose. And I just felt so much better when I lay down in front of the bulldozer. It was great. <laughs> um. The egg had frozen an accident. I thought of my life. The egg had frozen an accident. I thought of my life. I heated the butter anyhow. The shell peeled easily. Inside it looked both translucent and boiled. I moved it around in the pan. It melted, the white first clearing to transparent liquid, then turning solid and bright again like good laundry. The yolk kept its yolk shape. Not fried, not scrambled, in the end it was cooked. <laughs> With pepper and salt I ate it. My life that resembled it ate it. It tasted like any other wrecked thing. <laughs> Eggish and tender, a banquet. <laughs> a small-sized mystery. Leave a door open long enough, a cat will enter. Leave food, it will stay. 
Soon, on cold nights, you'll be saying, excuse me, if you want to get out of your chair. <laughs> but one thing you'll never hear from a cat is, excuse me. <laughs> nor Einstein's famous theorem, nor the quality of mercy is not strained. In the dictionary of cat, mercy is missing. In this world where much is missing, a cat fills only a cat-sized hole. Yet your whole body turns toward it again and again because it is there. So I'm trying to decide whether to read the villanelle before the last three. We do, okay, we're getting some villanelle nods. In other words, I'm warning you that it's a little longer than it might have been, but not too long. Um, so so um, for those of you who don't know what a villanelle is, I'm not going to give you the proper definition. I'm just going to say it's a form that has some repeats in it. And three of the greatest poems in the English language are villanelles, Elizabeth Bishop's One Art, Dylan Thomas's Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night, and Theodore Rutke's The Waking. Um, I always wondered if I would write my one villanelle, and then it came. It's a loose villanelle, for those who do know what it is. It's a little, little shaggy. <laughs> a hand is shaped for what it holds or makes. A hand is shaped for what it holds or makes. Time takes what's handed to it then, warm bread, a stone, a child whose fingers touch the page to keep her place. Beloved, grown old separately, your face shows me the changes on my own. I see the histories it holds, the argument it makes against the thresh of trees, the racing clouds, the race of birds and sky, birds always lose. The lines have ranged, but not the cheek's strong bone. My fingers touching there recall that place. Once we were one, then what time did and hands erased us from the future we had owned. For some, the future holds what hands release, not make. We made a bridge, we walked it, laced night's sounds with passion. Owls' penny whistles after took our place. Wasps leave their nest, wind takes the papery case. Our wooden house less easily undone now houses others. A life is shaped by what it holds or makes. I make these words for what they can't replace. So this book is obviously time haunted. I think a lot of my work has been for a long time. And I think, you know, one of the interesting things about poetry is poetry makes absolutely free with time. It's part of how it works. So for example, that poem I read uh, near the start, The Conversation. So it's all one evening's party, and yet you've got you know, this boat full of generations of spiders going, going down the Amazon. Um, and then it just folds back, back like, like uh, that marvelous children's book, A Wrinkle in Time, that I just adored when I was young. Um, but this poem is not about uh, poetry's mastery of time. This one is about time's mastery of us and how it never quite proceeds on clock pace. A day is vast. A day is vast until noon. Then it's over. <laughs> Yesterday's pond water braided still wet in my hair. I don't know what time is. You can't ever find it, but you can lose it. So two, two more. Um, this first one is, as I like to say, the closest thing to an Irish ballad I've ever written. 
Um, a, a lovely Irish woman came to one of my first readings from this book, and I went up to her afterwards, and I said, am I, am I right about that? And she said, oh, yes, dear, sounds just like an Irish ballad. Um, so. I ran out naked in the sun. I ran out naked in the sun, and who could blame me? Who could blame? The day was warm. I ran out naked in the rain, and who could blame me? Who could blame the storm? I leaned toward sixty, that day almost done. It thundered then. I wanted more, I shouted more. And who could blame me? Who could blame had been before? Could blame me that I wanted more. And the last poem, uh, any of you who have a garden will recognize this phenomenon well, but any of you who don't have a garden, I think we all uh, learn something about permeability in this life. The supple deer. The quiet opening between fence strands, perhaps 18 inches, Antlers to hind hooves, four feet off the ground, the deer poured through. No tuft of the coarse white belly hair left behind. I don't know how a stag turns into a stream, an arc of water. I have never felt such accurate envy. Not of the deer. To be that porous, to have such largeness, through me. Thank you. <laughs>